Hi, welcome to Hardware Basics Chapter 2. Here we'll be talking all about motherboards. Okay, so in this session we're going to describe and uh, contrast various types and features of motherboards. Uh, we're going to configure a motherboard using BIOS or UEFI. So BIOS is basic input output system. And the newer version with better security is UEFI, which is Unis Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. Okay, so by this time, week four, you should have been reading a fair bit. If you haven't, you have a lot to catch up on. It's very important that you keep up with the reading so you're on track. Um, some students have described to me that it's, it's quite hard to remember all these new, t excuse me, new terms. Um, what I would suggest is when you're reading through the book, have a blank exercise book next to you and take notes. Say, okay, bias equals basic input output system and make yourself some cheat sheets. So when you go back later, you could just read your notes, make your life a lot easier when studying. Oh, where was I? Was I? Um, maintain a motherboard by updating drivers and firmware. Uh, using jumpers to clear BIOS or UFI settings. Uh, or you can do this with the CMOS battery as well by removing power. Um, select and install and replace a desktop motherboard or a laptop system board. You can keep call it either motherboard, system board. All right, so when you're looking to get a computer, uh, build one, motherboard is one of the first items to consider when building a computer. So consider the following, your form factor. Okay, so basically this is the size. How big a motherboard do I want? What sort of, you know, is that going to fit in my case? How many options do I need, right? So um, how many slots do I need? The, big, the bigger it is, obviously, the more you can fit. Um, your processor socket. Okay, so you can see here that this one is an LGA1151. If you buy a CPU that is LGA1150, then that's not going to be compatible. So you have to make sure, okay, if I want this CPU, what sort of motherboard do I need to get? And the chipset, and we'll talk about that later. Um, expansion slots. Do, am I happy with just PCI or do I need a lot of PCIe, which is much faster? Um, obviously you want some, some USB slots. We use USB um, everywhere these days, but you might want to check, is it USB 2.0 or USB 3.0? Because USB 2.0 transferring a whole heap of big files could take two hours, while with USB 3.0, it could take 20 minutes. So there's something to consider there too. What, what do you need? Um, any other connectors, uh, slots or ports that are really important for you? Do you want USB-C? That's the latest technology, that's great. Very fast. Okay, so form factors. The, the most popular, you've got your ATX, which is your largest, your micro ATX, which we would place in the middle there, and mini ITX. Okay, as you can see, how many slots you have and how many ports you can have, and all these bits and pieces. Look, all these ones for your SATA hard drives. You don't have as much over here. So, Moving forward, 
they have set standards with um, places for your screw, your screw holes there um, to put them into place. Okay. So everyone will be able to fit them into their casing there. So a chipset is a chip, is a set of chips, okay, on the motherboard that works closely with the processor to control memory buses on the motherboard and some per peripherals. Okay, so think of a chipset like a, um, a, all right, so chips were all over the motherboard before and then they centralized them to make them a chipset. So then your chipset, you can think of like a, a bus interchange, okay? All the information goes into the chipset is in, in sent somewhere else along a bus. So it's very, very important for, oh, I've just powered up. Uh, sorry about that. A socket is a, is rectangular with pins or pads that connect to the processor on the motherboard. And the, the two major chipset and process, processor manufacturers are Intel and AMD. All right, let's talk about um, Intel chipsets. So your latest um, Intel chipset is Comet Lake. Uh, before that, it was Coffee Lake, Kaby Lake, Sky Lake. So these these um, relate to all your different um, generations. Uh, how you can tell which one is what generation. There's a number here, right there. So i5-6200 is a sixth generation processor. Now this 200 part here is how good that will be. The higher the number, the better. And you, you're gonna have to look up the numbers. Um, I think that one's overclocking. Um, I've got an example here from Specky. And this one is a Core i7 6700HQ. So the sixth, sixth generation, roughly about 2016, 700, that's doing better than a 200, obviously, in HQ, high quality. You'd have something like this for gaming. And this is on, uh, and this has Skylake. And there's some temperatures and how they're all, all the different cores are running. Spec is a great program. We'll talk about that a bit more later on. Okay, and obviously your i3, i5, i7, and i9. i3 is the lowest. I wouldn't be buying any i3s unless you want to be disappointed six months down the track when you've loaded all your programs on there. It's going to run very slow. i5 would be decent. Uh, I always think that you should get a bit more than what you need, so I like to get an i7 and i9 is probably awesome but uh, i don't own one of those let's have a look at this okay so getting more into processor sockets here's the socket and your processor sits on top of this now this is a lga which is a land grid array uh, so basically, all the pins are coming from the motherboard. And you have a flat um, CPU that sits on top. While a PGA, pin grid array, is where you have a CPU that has pins on it. And you slot those pins into the motherboard. Now, the issue with that is, is that the pins can very easily bend. And if you'd like an example of that, uh, see me in class, and I'd be happy to show you the, the difference between the two, and you'll see. And highly likely, 
the one with the PGA pin grid array will be bent. Okay, and it's uh, 1151 socket in this one. Okay, and this cover, you push down and hold that in place. Okay, so um, let's talk about the LGA sockets. So, I mean, way back when um, you had your Sandy Bridge or Ivy Bridge, which was um, an LGA 1155. And then it actually changed to um, your Haswell and Broadwell, which was LGA 1150. And then we moved up to uh, LGA 1151. And this was um, Sky Lake, Coffee Lake, KB Lake. And now we're moving into the LGA 1200, which is uh, Comet Lake. And I don't want to talk about this is the 1700 at this stage, but obviously with your different um, uh, grid arrays and your different generations, you can support different types of RAM. Um, so the LGA 115 will support DDR3 and DDR4, while older ones will only support DDR2 RAM. And obviously the faster the RAM, the better. And then there's some for high performance workstations. Same sort of scenario with your different generations. All right, so your zero insertion four sockets are used to lift the processor up and out of the socket using levers. Um, when you want to match a processor to a motherboard, make sure you look at the, the um, motherboard manufacturer's website um, or a user guide. Do your research, make sure you're getting those two things, those two really important things that you need matching up with each other. And don't go cheap on those either. All right, so a bus is a system of pathways for communication. Okay, and they send the protocols through there. Right, the protocols is a set of rules and standards for two entities to use for communication. So if I'm speaking to someone in Japan on the Philippines, if they're speaking their native language, they're speaking Japanese or they're speaking Tagalog, I'm not gonna understand what's going on. But if they're speaking English, then we can effectively communicate. PCI Express, it's also known as PCIe. So when you hear me refer to PCIe, that's PCI Express. It's faster than PCI, much faster. Um, it comes in different slot sizes. So you might have a, a times one, times one here, times one, times four, times eight, times 16. Okay, so that X refers to the amount of lanes for data. So the more the better. Um, PCIe 16 slot is used by graphics cards. Okay, because we want to be pushing a lot of data through that graphics card. If you're a gamer, you understand that you want this really beefy graphics card and they, they do get quite hot these days and you'll have big heat sinks and fans on the graphics cards. Um, and you may also know about this from uh, data mining, Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining. Um, people are using graphics cards because it is, is designed to do, do a particular task very, very well uh, with a lot of power. Your, the difference between your 
your GPU and your CPU is that the CPU is designed to be doing a lot of different tasks at once and managing all those tasks. So the raw power from a graphics card uh, is great for processing um, all those graphics or uh, Bitcoin mining. All right, so here is a picture of a Molex style connector. And I've, if I've ever spoken to you about uh, my floppy drives, my um, the, they're playing music. Um, I had plenty of Molex connectors, but no Berg connectors. Well, I did one. Um, so I had to adapt those over to Berg connectors because floppy drives are being phased out these days. Okay, and here's a SATA style power connector. It's not a very good picture. I'll try and find a better one in the future. Okay, conventional PCI slots and buses are slower than those of PCIe. Absolutely, that's what the Express stands for. Um, the slots are slightly taller than PCIe slots. Transmits 32 bits of data in parallel and operates about 500 megabits a second. Um, used for all types of add-on cards. A riser card. Okay, so if you have a, a low profile, slimline, small form factor um, case, right, and you can't fit a particular card upright, but you'd be able to fit it sideways, you would slot this into your slot, um, into your um, PCI or PCIe slot, and it would actually turn that slot to the side so you could then slot your, let's say, graphics card in sideways. Onboard ports. Okay, so back in the day, you used to have um, just one connector built onto the motherboard. And I can show you an example of that. Um, and then if you wanted some, um, some sound ports, you would have to actually install a card for sound ports. And you would have to install a card for serial port or a card for a parallel port. And then later on, a card for a USB port. And there, there was all these um, cards, and you only had a certain amount of card slots. So later on, they in, uh, integrated all of these ports onto the motherboard. Um, so you have all that available for you already. See so your um, Ethernet port. PS2. Um, PS2, not PlayStation 2, it's actually a, a type of um, keyboard or mouse port um, that was used before we moved into USB. We had lots of different ports for all sorts of things and, and um, someone said, hey, how about we just use one type for everything? Just make it universal instead of having different ones for different brands. Let's have something that everybody can use across all the brands. So USB universal serial bus was born. Okay, um, in, in IO shield, input output shield um, is a plate installed uh, in the computer case, providing holes for those input output ports. These things, they're all sending data in and out. Um, and then you've got internal connectors for USB, M.2, and we'll get into that later. Great technology, um, ISADA and IDE. Um, and IDE is very, very old. Um, it's called inter Integrated uh, Drive Electronics. It's used a long time ago. Um, unless you're playing with some really old equipment, you, you're not likely to see it. Uh, input output shield. Um, 
is pre-installed in the computer case providing holes. Um, it shields those ports against melee attacks and also magical attacks. Just kidding. I'm just seeing if you're still paying attention. <laughs> I shouldn't say stuff like that. People will believe it. You know, I've had people say to me, I show them a floppy drive and they go, wow, you, pre you 3D printed a, a save icon. Oh, no. But you're scaring me. <laughs> okay, your, yep, your internal connectors, USB, M.2, SATA, IDE. SATA stands for Serial Advanced Technology Attachment or Serial ATA, um, as opposed to PADA, which is your old school par parallel type, um, way back when. Current versions of SATA, I, SATA Express. Okay, so we had, we had SATA, SATA 2, SATA 3. Um, SSDs were um, increasing in speed at ridiculous rates and SATA could not keep up with the speed that SSDs, solid state drives were moving forward. So they came out with SATA Express. Um, but around the same time, M.2 came in. And so SATA E is pretty much a failed um, you know, it was one of those ones, everybody's experimenting at the same time and not some of them don't make it and that one didn't really make it. You would be lucky to, um, to get that. M.2 is so much faster, so much more efficient. Um, it was formerly known as the next generation form factor. M.2 is less of a mouthful. Um, it uses PCIe. Um, it can use uh, USB or SATA interface. Obviously, it gets uh, slower if it's using SATA, but M.2 PCIe, beautiful. That's what we're running on our SSDs today. So here's your M.2 slot here. So unlike RAM, where your RAM stands up uh, vertically, in its slot, the M.2 um, lies horizontal and then it's actually held down by a screw. So just like RAM, they have um, different um, gaps in each of the connectors to signify certain types. So DDR2 is not the same as DDR3. Same with your um, M.2, your, your B key is in a different spot to your M key and they have different lanes, two lanes versus four lanes on your PCIe and uh, 10 megabits, no 10, sorry, gigabits versus 20 gigabits, I'm pretty sure. But have a look that up, there's a good article um, out there by Seuss that tells you about, about these. All right, so integrated graphics, uh, integrated drive electronics, not, um, not the integrated development environment. That's, that's a um, programming area. I know it's, it's painful when they use the same acronym for things in IT, but you're going to come across these. So I just thought I'd point that out. It has a whole heap of pins. Um, and you would use that, you use these to connect up um, uh, old ID hard drives or your floppy drives, where I use on my floppy machine. Okay, so on this motherboard, you can see um, some USB 2.0 connectors and you would plug in 
the data cable there, which would then go out to um, USB ports on, well, on the front or the back of the computer, really. Um, however, the manufacturer has designed it. And over here, you have your SATA three ports. Firmware on the motherboard is used to enable or disable a connector, a port or a component. You want to switch something off. You want to turn off the, the built-in um, um, network card or, you know, you want to turn off USB ports so no one can use the USB ports or whatever you need to do for your um, security concerns. Um, they obviously didn't do that where Snowden was. Whoops. Uh, anyway, um, control the frequency um, and other features of a CPU. So overclocking your CPU, making it run faster than what the, the, the manufacturer recommends. If you're doing that, you put a bigger heat sink and a bigger fan on there, or you might consider some liquid cooling. I'm not really a fan of liquid cooling, but um, just mucking around with liquid neuro new circuitry worries me um, managing security features so um, in your bias are you setting up a password to get into bias or to access a drive or to um, look e even some have the option where you can switch over whether the case can be opened or not so there will be a little motor that will move a pin and it'll slot through a hole and it will stop you from removing a, a motherboard case, the, 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 the cover on the case for your um, computer. So that's a cool feature. If you want me to point that out in class, let me know. Um, control what happens when the, when the computer first boots. Um, monitor any issues. You can monitor whether the case has been opened. So let's say you don't want to lock the case, but you want to know when someone's been playing inside. Certainly can set that up too. Um, so after 2012, BIOS and UEFI firmware was used. Before 2012, motherboards used BIOS. And again, UEFI stands for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. It improves on BIOS, um, but includes BIOS backward compatibility. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. UEFI is required for hard drives larger than two terabytes. Okay. Um, UEFI offers secure boot. So this is going to stop um, drivers loading that are not digitally signed um, and this makes sure that you're not getting malware um, coming in and um, loading before the operating system um, loads okay um, for backward compatibility UEFI can boot from a master boot record hard drive and provide BIOS boot through its compatibility support module, CSM feature. Accessing the BIOS, check the manufacturer's manual. It could be F12, it could be F2, it could be Dell, it could be F10. Um, so you'd have to look into that before trying to go into BIOS or randomly try things and see what happens. Here is a picture of BIOS. Okay, it's very plain. Um, and then you see UEFI, which could have some little graphics and some um, gauges and all sorts of things in there. Um, so with setup for the boot menu, you can decide where um, the computer boots first. So you could say, okay, um, first I'm gonna to try to boot from the USB or DVD, then I'll boot from the hard drive. That way, if I wanna install an operating system, I can. You could boot from the network. Okay, so that's where we get our imaging menu. 
and you can choose to boot from the hard drive or you can image um, your machine. Okay, so you set this via a boot priority order or a boot sequence, whatever it's called in your BIOS slash UEFI. As I said, secure boot was invented to prevent malware um, from launching before the OS um, and anti-malware software had the chance to load. Um, it only works in UEFI. It doesn't work in your compatibility mode for BIOS, um, supported by Windows 8 and, and 10, um, and several distributions of Linux. Secure boot holds digital signatures, um, encryption encryption keys and drivers in databases they might be stored on flash memory or in uh, on the on the motherboard or on the hard drive um, it checks all these things before they load to ensure that things are secured um, so you've got lots of options to change um, your boot options i encourage you to have a look through bios or uefi uh, don't play around with it in your personal computer, but you're welcome to play around with it with ours. Uh, break our computers, not yours. All right, so I've already, I've already spoken about this. You can disable some things through BIOS, network ports, USB ports, video ports. Um, you can overclock the, the processor, make things go faster. Obviously, overclocking will make everything hotter. Other security features um, besides the secure boot, I've already talked about power on passwords. Lojack is for, um, it's, it's like find my iPhone for laptops, um, drive password protection, your uh, TPM, chip, which is your trusted platform module chip, and any drive encryption that you may want to place on there. Yeah, power on passwords. It is what it sounds like. When you power up, you'll need to enter a password. Lojack, so um, any compute trace agent technology are embedded in the firmware of many laptops protect against theft. Okay, you must subscribe for this service, so you're paying for it. Um, and um, you can locate a laptop whenever it connects to the internet. Once located, you can give commands through the internet to lock the laptop or delete all data on it. Um, and you can set drive password protection. Some motherboards allow you to do this. Um, yeah, but that, that was, that's basically find my iPhone for laptops, low jack. Remember that, I think it's on a test. Um, okay. So trusted platform module chip, um, the bit, bit locker encryption tool in windows 10, eight, seven works with this chip. Um, assures that the, the drive can't be used in another computer. Um, if the motherboard fails and it's replaced, you'll need a backup copy of the startup key to access the drive. So be careful. Um, virtualization is when you're setting up virtual machines. Okay, a virtual machine simulates the hardware of a physical computer. So if you're working um, in, if you're studying other subjects and you're doing network operating systems or operating systems basics, you could be using um, machines in the cloud um, and you could actually use something like Hyper-V to um, create a virtual machine within a virtual machine and have virtual machine inception. Also, if you're using something like Specky, oops, Specky, if you use it on a virtual machine, you're probably going to be missing certain amounts of data. So if you need to do something like that for Opsys, um, 
you specking on your own computer. It's not going to hurt. Um, it's a cool little tool. Device drivers are small programs that allow software to interact with certain hardware. Okay, so that's in between there. Um, so you can install drivers for your graphics card or ports um, or any any other sort of things that you might need to set up. Uh, Windows was automatically updating drivers. Now in the latest revision of Windows 10, they have taken that away and you should, um, because they, it can cause issues every time they do an update. So um, it's best to go to the manufacturer's website really. So look that up. Updating firmware, um, look, try to, if there's nothing wrong, there's no need to fix it, okay? So you don't want to be messing around with, with your BIOS or your UEFI, um, but if the sync system hangs at odd times or during boot, if the motherboard functions have stopped working or are causing problems, if you get errors installing a new OS, um, or maybe there's some new features that you can use, um, then, then you would want to update your firmware. All right, so jumpers, you've got these little pins and depending on your configuration and the manufacturer's settings, you can close over a couple of pins and change a setting, reset a, uh, a pass, power on password that you've forgotten. Um, you could un undo an update. Um, so yeah. That's one way. CMOS, all right. Complementary metal oxide semiconductor. I'm telling you, no one calls it that. Um, CMOS, everyone calls it CMOS. It's a method of um, manufacturing chips. Um, there's a small amount of memory that's stored on the motherboard that retains data even when the computer is turned off. So that's why you've got your CMOS battery. So all those settings in BIOS that you've set up um, are in CMOS. And if you take the CMOS battery out, that information is lost. So you can reset your password that way. All right, so when selecting a desktop motherboard, ask yourself, how is the motherboard to be used? What do I need it for? Okay, what do I want? What sort of um, ports? What am you know? How how super duper does it need to be? Um, what form factor do I want? Okay, what size? We talked about the, the sizes before. Is it ATX? Is it micro ATX? Is it MITX? What are we looking for there? Um, which brand? Do you, are you Team Intel or are you Team AMD? Okay, and um, what sort of processes do the, does the board support? What chipset does it use? Um, so that's really important. So do your research before you before you look into it, and also what type and speed of memory does the board support? Oh, you know if if. It, you've got something that does DDR2 memory. Yes, but DDR2 or DDR3, they have, so DDR2 will have different speeds and then DDR3 will have different speeds and DDR4 will have different speeds. So what is the specific speed that you can run on that motherboard? All right, um, what are the embedded expansion slots? What are the connectors? Uh, what devices are on board? Do you have a graphics card on board or do you need to plug a graphics card into the board? Okay. Um, does the board fit the case you plan to use? That's the size, really. Um, um, what's the price and the warranty on the board? Does the board get good reviews? Check it out. This, you know, Z490 whatever whatever you've got whatever you're looking for review okay how 
extensive and user-friendly is the documentation? And how helpful is the manufacturer's website? Um, you know, what warranty do you get? How much support do you get? Very important. So um, replacing a laptop top motherboard. Look, if it's, if it's um, this is the last slide. If you have a laptop motherboard and your laptop has, I mean, look, if it's, if it's very new, it'd be worth the money to, to um, change it, but you should be under warranty if it's very new. So if it's within, within two years and you've got warranty, it should just be replaced by the manufacturer. And I'm sure you wouldn't mind paying the postage to get it um, done if that's their requirement. I'm not sure what their, um, what their terms are on their warranties. Um, but that would be very little to pay compared to paying for a new motherboard. Um, but if it's an older, um, if it's an older laptop and you have motherboard issues, then it becomes a expensive paperweight or Frisbee pretty much because the amount of money that you would spend to replace the motherboard would be money that would be better invested in buying a new laptop. All right, so there's just chapter summary really. So I hope you enjoyed this week's lesson on um, motherboards, the hardware, hardware basics. Until next time, take care.